good afternoon good evening i go on to hamadinatama so today's meeting uh, is uh, open forum so we can have all your suggestions uh, uh, any comments and so on to find a solution to brain drain from sri lanka so that's our topic but this is not a thing that we can solve just overnight but at least trying to find the reasons and find proposed resolutions is what we are trying to do today so um i've got a, another meeting to follow on at 8 o'clock that will also partly looking at this problem but let's see what uh, reasons are there so i'll talk about 10 minutes and then after that we'll start the discussion so please note our email address uh, admin at sri lanka leads.com because if you have comments uh, or suggestions even after the discussion uh, please send it to admin at sri lanka leads.com we can make use of all the suggestions first of all i have to congratulate india for reaching my destination they told uh, on 23rd of august south pole of the moon as the first nation to got there from the world so now uh, if you look at a little bit but that's actually india's effort it, if you see the people who are working there india's effort to recruit and retain their academics have paid off because although some might think this is waste of money this is actually um, another step forward so that they will have more contracts more avenues more academics working in the country for the country's benefit so so this is uh, uh, one thing that they had done but we should also look at see what we have done here in sri lanka uh, and we should see compare and see whether we are kind of thinking on the same lines if you look at the costs for 2023 Uh, moon mission from uh, india it was uh, us dollars 74 million now if you compare it with our mathala airport 10 years ago this would have been more than what is mentioned here so that was 209 million us dollars so basically if sri lanka could have funded three trips to the moon if we did not do the mathala airport but did we do anything with this to retain our academics and staff we did not look at the costs as well i think it's important to look at the costs india has 1400 million people so each one for 74 million you have to bear half a cent of a us dollar purpose that's less than indian 2 rupees if you look at sri lanka we have only 22 million for this uh, amount we approximately each one of us has to buy about 10 dollars per person in today's cost that is uh, about 3000 rupees per person but look at these projects okay that has taken place in sri lanka and you can see why we have become bankrupt say uh, there was a air bus ganu denu edi ahatawa dakapu nathi plane walta gepu paaduwa 98 million then minisu en nathi guwan tatupalak hadanna dollar miriyana 209 million then palam uh, fly over palam dala wahana yanne nathi hambantota parawal walta us dollars 200 million then uh, this is moolikatwe de youth vyaprati walin obbata gos idikanala da avurudu gannawak neme krema nakwa umaya vyapratiya 529 million then dollar biniyala dahasunakata wada ihela poliyata gat antarjatika batum karawalata us dollars 13 billion then nalum kutuna වගේ දෙගුණයක් වියදම් කරලා නඩත් කිරීමෙන් අභියෝගයක් වෙති ඇති බත්තර මුල්ල හමුදා මුල්ල ස්ථානය 200 million then uh, 90 million for uh, the uh, whatever called the hyatt regency godanagilla which has not been completed and then 
4,000 million for here, for the air lung colossus over the years. So look at this one. And so that is why our incomes and expenses have gone to unbearable levels. It's above the GDP at the moment. So we, how can we pay that without actually um, crucifying ourselves? So total loss, more than this, actually you have to add another 10,000 into it. So huge amount of millions of US dollars. This is more than this, again, 245 calculated, but I see this is 13 billion for these uh, bonds. And so it's huge costs. So now none were designed to retain and recruit our academics in any of these projects. But working class has to pay Basically, it's like slavery living in Sri Lanka at the moment. So what else do we do? Should we leave? So is that why another reason for brain drain is something that we have to think about? Because you will be paying back all this for your lifetime and you will not be able to recover. So I actually sent, I knew five doctors who emigrated recently, whom I have trained and everything else as well. And two who did not leave. So I wrote an email and asked, why are you staying and why are you leaving? Or why are you left? So I asked on seven. I had no reply from five and two excuse saying no time. So they, they highlighted what, what problems they had. So I gave them an option to say what it is, whether it's economic, whether it's academic for you or family whether it's children's education and future, whether it's personal or family threats, lack of confidence in Sri Lankan governments or specific innovation and research interests, or whether it's health needs personal or family, whether it's most of the family already abroad, or whether it's temporary versus permanent immigration. So I asked so many questions, but I have not got any reply. But there's lots of information in the media uh, giving people saying various things. So I thought I'll extract some of this so we get a little bit of background as to why. So the country is fast running out of dons to keep universities ticking. Now, this is an important area that needs to be sorted. Uh, so this is an extract from this article. To retain the job that is the university dons, while they study abroad, the probationary lecturers have to sign a bond with the university. You need two guarantors for the bond too. This has become a large bond because of the devaluation of the rupee and it is hard to find people to be guarantors. The bond can range from five to 10 million. So the probation lecturers forget about retaining the job, quit and leave, he said. So this is something that's bothering people at the moment in the university of juniors. The seniors, of course, will be leaving because they understand more about the situation and the difficulties. Then this article came from the rest of the world from Nilesh Christopher, Sri Lanka's brain drain problem. The message to retain talent, Sri Lankan IT companies have started pegging salaries to US dollars instead of the local currency, but that has had little impact. So even if there's economic support, still people are not planning to stay. So it is more than just economy that's driving people out. This one, this article came from uh, Dr. Upul Vijayavadana, who tend to write very, very uh, important and very justified documents. And he wrote saying, fear of JVP regime, is it reason for brain drain? Now here they commented a few things. The phenomenon of brain exodus is multifactorial and the tackling of it requires a proper study thereof and a multi-pronged strategy. Not all reasons that doctors and other professionals have given for their hasty migration are acceptable or convincing, but the fact remains that the government is driving them away and therefore duty bound to clean up the mess of its own making. Then the, the, the same article says, what started as a protest campaign by the suffering masses was hijacked by the JVP and its cousin FSP. 
then many professionals fear that the JV, hippie, JVP would make their lives miserable. So this is uh, history. Now, uh, another article there on brain drain and poor nations. So it is a major challenge for poor nations. That's what the summary of this article. Here is the brain drain crippling schools. This is from uh, teachers of English, mathematics, and information technology are among those who are migrating in large numbers. J JVP led Ceylon Teachers Services Union has said, adding that about 5,000 teachers have left the country during the past nine months alone. Here's some, some figures. Then this article in single is Vaidivaru Ratayati Horadostara Behedeti. So Rataharaginti and a Bautara Dushkara Rohalwala the Vaidivaru. Pasugiya Vasaratura Visheshakta Vaidiru Desi Hatalis Hatak, Sani Vairidu Atasi Hatalis Dega Kratin Gihim. Lankave Vaidivru theatre Nisi Gauravia Klabinine. Englante Sevakarna Lankave Vaidivari. Pavatina Jiva the Via the Masamaga Vaidivur and Telabella Padia Jiva Timur from Manavatne. Raja Vaidivurunga Sanga Idriedi Merata Sauki Shestri, Devanta Kadavatikim Vilakinwa Raja Vaidurunga San Sade. So then uh, this article, uh, this is a YouTube thing. Uh, then in the Vaidivurut Ati, this was from Ravi Kumadesh. Um, I asked Ravi to join. He has not come uh, yet, but I'll mention if he comes, he can maybe come in. Uh, uh, Saukya Urtika Ratahara Yama Velakim Chakra Elikavalin Karanayam Atisa Reta Amudagasima Tamai Eight Atisa Reta Behid then Vaki Utan Vedapilak Netang Amudia Karigahaneka Atisa Reta Visanduma Saukya Matanshe Visanduma. So this is something that is uh, being discussed and criticized by uh, Ravi Kumadi, who is very, very good speaker. And uh, then uh, this is uh, from a discussion that I've gathered. The take-home message of a tel television discussion was that the recent brain drain of medical and IT professionals and university academics and also senior nursing staff, etc., will have a great long-term adverse effect on our service sector, economy, and Sri Lankan public health and education sectors, which cannot be easily repaired for many years. So this is not the time for us to uh, kind of sit back and watch because it will affect our relatives, our, ourselves, our third generation and so on. So there is a need to for us to find some solutions, even if it's a patch of work, because if we bridge the gap some way, the day somebody brings the resolution properly, then the things will start to catch up. That's why we need to discuss why the reasons are, because without knowing the reasons, we can't find the solutions. But also, we can find ways to bridge the gap. This is an article and a PDF document that's been written by Vijayananda Jayavira about um, deliberative democracy that seeks quality over quantity by limiting decision makers to a smaller but more representative sample of the population. This is a very good concept that's been written. I wrote to him as well, if it's possible to join. I don't know whether he's in the audience. So, uh, so the next meeting that we are going to do, we are proposing a small solution, uh, but I think we will need a lot of help if you want, if you want to do that. So the, the, we are trying to have an edutainment event to kind of bring the message home saying we do need to change. But in that event, because it's an event that where hopefully more people participating, the <clears throat> event, we can probably use that as a fundraising event to create a virtual platform in 2024, at least to uh, cover the national curricula virtually, uh, for, for at least for English, science, mathematics, IT, and humanity. So we may be able to do that. This is a realistic proposal, practically possible. And I will discuss this proposal in detail um, at 8 o'clock in the next meeting. 
So I'll stop sharing from now and I'll allow you to speak and discuss and tell us your ideas because then we can take it forward from there. Thank you. Any any ideas, any comments? Anybody at all? Uh, Hi, Jula. Um, yeah. Yes, Jivanand. Yes, Jivanand. Yeah. Uh, I will. I will share with you my own experience. Yeah. Uh, some of the factors actually didn't come up, you know, the during the, the what you explained. Yeah. So I finished my PhD uh, forty years ago. Yeah. Uh, I, I, and myself and my wife, we went on our own, not through any university or any organization. The uh, any uh, sponsored by any of the local institutions. Yeah. So we finished our PhD, went back to Sri Lanka, and uh, I started working as a temporary person for a WHO project at Peradun uh, um, University Science Faculty. Probably you remember that. You know, there's a, a Professor Jayasena and the crowd involved in, in medicinal plants project. Uh huh. Okay. Anyway, yeah. So we both of us started looking for jobs. We, we, we seriously wanted to settle down in Sri Lanka and uh, bring up a family because, you know, we had a good experience growing up. You know, we thought that, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that, that's a good place to bring up a family and all that. However, uh, the problems we ran into is essentially, you know, this boils down to finding a job, okay? Now, yeah. we are with, with PhDs. Uh, the lack of meritocracy and corruption okay? yeah so we we got fed up with that yeah e even to get a, even to get a teaching position uh you you had to ha go back after the uh, local mp or whatever or or you know bribe all kinds of things that i don't want to go into details yeah. so those are the 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 meritocracy and corruption they are interrelated yeah so that's my number one problem yeah then the second one is job satisfaction yeah the unfortunately you know uh, that i could bear with because you know uh, i i was trained as a medicinal chemist you know we didn't have a uh, a drug in, in sri lanka there was no pharmaceutical industry as such back then yeah. uh, so that's the other uh, second number uh, two and then the third one is uh, quality of life yeah so those were the three things that drove us away from the country. Yeah, I mean, if we are promoting meritocracy in a in a quite strong way as a value uh, of our platform. And uh, also corruption is something that we need to address. That's a major thing that needs to be sorted. But to do that, the the um, the, the 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 judiciary has to be independent. So this is something we are working on. And the job satisfaction, yes, I mean, I have faced a similar situation. People who train abroad and come back are rejected to start with by your own local people as well because of um, various selfish interests. So, and that is one of the things and job satisfaction is a problem because everything is a hurdle. And um, I have experienced personally myself these things twice. And pharmacy, of course, I'm glad after major fight, we managed to get a degree situation for pharmacy graduate. And chemical pharmacy is actually now surfacing quite well uh, in Sri Lanka. And there are lots of people who have trained in Sri Lanka and now working abroad. So that is hopefully has changed that situation. But we still can do a lot to get things going. Yeah, thanks for your comment, uh, Jeevananda. And also, I think you have a little bit more experience about virtual platforms, isn't it? So um, that probably we'll discuss uh, at the next in the meeting. next meeting. Right? Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. Anything else um, that you can suggest? The reasons why? Yes, we can uh, think about that. Yeah. Is there any possibility we, we can put a uh, document, for example? Yes, Lakshman. Yeah, thank you, Jula. Yeah. 
I will take a few minutes. Uh, thank you for spending your valuable time <laughs> for coordinating this and preparing the ground uh, document. This brain drain is a <clears throat> is going to be a very very uh, serious uh, implication on Sri Lanka's future economic development. Uh, <clears throat> actually, uh, what is expected by the the government or the central bank? By imposing this tax on on professionals, is to uh, try to uh, you know sa save some uh, foreign exchange and and uh, local of course local rupees uh, to pay the uh, IMF loans. So this is uh, probably a minute fraction of the uh, compared to the loans that we have to pay, maybe twenty percent or something. I don't know. Uh, so, but uh, this is going to have very serious implications, uh, <clears throat> especially uh, when you look at the, the numbers uh, of people who have left uh, in 2022 and 2023. Uh, I have just uh, got some statistics in 2023, first quarter, 76,000 people have left uh, for foreign employment. This is from the central bank data. 2022, first quarter, 75,000 uh, have left compared to 2020, uh, 39,000. So it's more than double the numbers have left in 2022 and 2023 in a single quarter, just for comparison. Uh, I, I, I see a very uh, long-term, uh, very adverse effect on this. The government may be... Uh, earning some uh, funds from the taxes of these people, these professionals, mostly from doctors, IT professionals, and even uh, uh, university teachers and the nurses, the senior nurses. So government earns some taxes, right? I mean, gain some income from the taxes of these people to, to uh, repay the IMF loan. But uh, what are the long-term implications of these professionals leaving the country? Uh, <clears throat> Sri Lanka will be affected in the long run because all these professionals are uh, part of the part of the main uh, dream of the uh, country, the social fabric. So without, uh, I think roughly, even if one third of uh, these people leave the country, uh, will have a long-term effect. To quote a few examples, recently I was listening to a TV discussion. The IT industry in Sri Lanka earlier uh, was uh, bringing in some close to uh, five uh, billion uh, dollars worth jobs to Sri Lanka. Uh, maybe Mervin, uh, <laughs> somebody would know better. Uh, now, when these people leave the country and even some uh, IT industries, major industries like Virtusa is going to leave the country. So uh, this uh, this amount of dollars which are earlier coming to the country will be, uh, not be available anymore. And these are long-term effects. Uh, similarly, with the doctors and other professionals, university teachers, uh, without, without uh, these professional categories, how can a, run, a country run in the years to come? So this is something these tax collectors don't see. You know? This is something like, if you quote a simple example, uh, every year the budget uh, people uh, push the tax up of, say, liquor, uh, Iraq bottles or something, they put the taxes up. Then what happens is people uh, stop buying the <laughs> liquor. So they don't get the income they expect. But this is much more complex situation that uh, I was uh, explaining with regard to the professionals, which has to be in a country for a country to develop. So which the government don't realize deliberately or uh, it's not only collecting uh, the tax income, uh, consider the loss for the country of these trained professionals. Now I also have some statistics to train a medical doctor single medical doctor, we spend 4 million uh, rupees. And a dental surgeon, 8 million rupees. Medical specialist, 11 million rupees. So these are the trained people uh, that are leaving the country. It's not easy to replace these people. It's going to be a long-term uh, struggle. 
so this is just a summary. I mean, it's not only the collection collecting taxes from these people, but no one is bothered about the long term effects of the country of losing these professionals. Thank you. Now, I think uh, thanks, Lakshman. I think you are right in a way what you are saying, uh, but um, I mean we don't have to think it's a hopeless situation because we may be able to find the solutions. And the and the I have little faith on the government to resolve the problem because there was a time when uh, the government gave only one percent of the GDP for education. And uh, university staff went on a strike and on the roads for three months in the country and nothing was done. So, so and uh, whether purposefully they are doing this, I don't know because none of the politicians uh, ever talk about uplifting uh, education or promoting meritocracy. And uh, even within the universities, it's still centrally controlled. And uh, the university uh, revolution document that we have written will probably go into publication very soon and then once it's published we may be able to uh, say that the university paradigm should change so the so the university should have autonomy to do what they need to do to save the quality of the education and therefore there is a possibility if we push hard that you can get teachers who have emigrated to teach virtually and uh, so then you need only practical things to be conducted uh, here. So face to face. So there is a way out, but this opening is not there. So if you are working from abroad as a visiting person to conduct lectures and discussions, tutorials, then the, the technology is there. And but the payments, everything has to be sorted. So now that doesn't that kind of thing doesn't have uh, in any of the universities. So if you promote automaticity or automatic governance for the universities, then they will come out with ideas how to promote it. So that's what we should do. So to do that, we should strongly propose that in a document, maybe publication, maybe a few of us get together and write a document because the university document is very good. I will circulate it uh, as soon as it's published, but it is at the moment under our uh, our website. Uh, we have a for uh, blueprints, and the document is there if you want to look at it. So, so the uh, we can do it, but getting virtual education for them, and then getting practicals done by the remaining staff, and also if the universities are autonomous, they can decide to give extra allowances to staff based on their location, amount of uh, money they earn for the university, etc. So there is provision to do, and that is important. At the moment, it's hugely restricted. Even the innovations you done by university staff does not bring any money to them. So that's the situation. So it's not totally, totally hopeless, but I think we should do something about that, but we need collective effort to do it. Yes, Tula, what you said is uh, maybe possible with the university teaching staff to some yeah. extent, but not with medical <laughs> professionals. I mean, uh, operating it remotely. Medical is, professionals is like this. I mean, I know I can talk a little bit about medical professional situation. Even now in the UK, for example, most of the consultations are actually uh, done virtually so there's right. a system telephone system and also you got computer programs to bit of an ai or or patterns so that the uh, the system suggests where the patient should go say for example you have a problem emergency you ring 111 where um, sri lanka everyone has got a mobile phone these days so you can ring particular number and then you have a doctor or a train person talking and they will tick on a computer program their symptoms and so on then it will tell whether you will need immediate attention or not so they don't go to the hospital straight away and then there are virtual clinics there are virtual wards so the face-to-face -face, uh, need for consultation is reduced 
So, and the 24 hour cover can be done. I mean, uh, I was trying to, when I was trying to develop emergency medicine I, in Sri Lanka, I went to Australia and they had uh, in the best trauma center in what is called uh, in Melbourne. And they had three beds for emergency admissions in the trauma center for all the ambulance things. And they had all the facilities like uh, scanning, x-ray, ultrasound, everything on the bed itself where they are admitted. Then it was about six o'clock and they said, so how do you get reported? Because it's six o'clock, all the local doctors have gone and then how are they going to get reported? And immediately they automatically switch over to uh, England. So from six o'clock onwards in Australia, all the reports come from English doctors who are working in England. So, so they have 24 hour consultant cover online to get opinions on, on various images, et cetera. So a model can be developed that the, the stumbling block is no model can be developed when it's slowly, closely knit with all the corruption in the Ministry of Health. That's the important thing. So if the hospitals were given more boards or something, say a trust or something is formed, so they find the solutions to their problems, then this can be resolved. We don't have to have dead patients all the time for simple illnesses. And also some of the diseases self uh, recover mm -hmm. and we need to recognize that as well. So that can be done through the current available uh, um, artificial intelligence software. So, so again, a solution is possible, Lashmi. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, partly, yes. yes. Sorry, um, uh, I think, uh, Nirman, you... you uh, yeah, a couple of things that I'd like to just draw your attention to. Yeah. Nothing very important, but now when we are, when we are looking at a solution, yeah, I think we have to be very clear as to um, what we are actually trying to find a solution to. Yeah. Now, on the one hand, there is the problem of retention of a sufficient number of professionals to ensure that the, the population of the country is serviced by people with adequate professional knowledge and skills. Yeah. Now, I'm pretty sure that we can put a number on that. So we will know we may not have enough uh, to begin with, but at least we will know uh, to give our population a standard of living standard, we need so many of this type and this type and this type of professionals. So that is something that's knowable. So then there is another thing that we are also doing. We are producing professionals. And I remember very well that this brain drain is nothing new because from the time I can remember, all the very educated people I knew were sooner or later leaving the country and going. Not because they were really unhappy here, I guess but because they went to do better things in countries which gave them opportunities to do better and more, more challenging things, I guess. Even in my own class, most of my uh, uh, batteries in uh, working in NASA, Boeing, places like that, because they don't have those kind of opportunities here. It's not that they have any big problem with the country, right? So I think that um, we have to look at these two things different. Sri Lanka has always been a place which produced good professionals so good that even teachers were grabbed up by other countries, even our neighbors, Maldives, anywhere, they took them. On the other hand, we try to give our people a very high standard of living, so we want a certain number of professionals here. Fine. So I think we have to balance these two things off and clear our heads and not panic. It's not like we're having everybody running away, maybe just temporarily now, but once we get our house in order, once we have a policy driven model that can say that we need year in and year out so many professionals here, I think then people will understand there's a future for them in the country. Even people from abroad will come here. So this is another problem that we have. We have this great idea that Sri Lanka, all Sri Lanka's problems and even the problems of the rest of the world must be solved by Sri Lanka. Now, that is something we have to drop. If we need a certain thing, operation going in Sri Lanka, okay, if Sri Lankans would rather work in America than in Sri Lanka, get some Americans here, that's all right. Or, or anyone who will come here. 
the, the thing is we need so many professionals whether they come from Sri Lanka or from Australia or from India does not matter. If we have that policy driven model in place, I think we will get a clearer picture and we will not panic. I don't think there's anything to worry about here. What you were talking about, Chula, about upgrading our universities, education and all that, I'm pretty sure that is going to happen. The moment we get our minds clear and realize that our strength is to produce professionals here, not necessarily, our strength is not necessarily to retain them. But yes, we can we can produce. I'm sure other universities will come and join us and we will become known as a center which produces top level professionals. That's my yeah. thinking. I, I, I agree with you. Because uh, I was doing a guest lecture for Open University and then uh, another lecturer who spoke had various government links but working abroad told me that, you know, uh, we should restrict exit of professionals. I completely disagreed with him and said, what are you talking nonsense? Because, because you are abroad and then you are telling the rest of the people should be restricted exit from Sri Lanka and then you are completely mad and then then he shut up and then uh, then the this is a kind of thinking people have but our problem is um, meritocracy is a problem I mean I have experiences twice coming back to Sri Lanka to work but I have resisted it and tolerated all the rejections that you get I mean for example I was put on vacation of post because uh, I was on leave and I had a bond and uh, and saying no staff, you have to come back. So I couldn't stop a research project for a PhD and then come back to work in Sri Lanka. So I said no. And then they put me on vacation post in two weeks. Then I took it to the ombudsman to see that the government or the university violated my bond. So they had to give me my job back. So that's how I could come back to Sri Lanka. So, so I've experienced all these difficult situations, but the point is that we need to promote meritocracy in all education institutions. Even if a school wants to get a teacher from somewhere else or do virtual teaching to the students, they sh the principal should have some way of doing it. At the moment, you might get punished and get transferred elsewhere as well if you try to do anything that the government didn't want to do. So I think, I don't know whether this is deliberate as Lakshman suggested, that you know putting all the professionals in huge trouble and also not training sufficient numbers may be a, a strategy that is planned to keep the way it is going and favorable to these uh, corrupt politicians. So it's a possibility that we need to understand as well. But I think still it's good if we can uh, make a kind of a blueprint as to how to find the solution to brain drain um, uh, and keep the services as it is because we can find new models. Yeah, I think uh, I agree with uh, Nirmal on uh, uh, this statement that we must have a critical mass of all the professionals, critical number for the country to serve. And then uh, in addition to that, uh, we can produce uh, new professionals and I mean, this brain drain has been there forever, but what we see during the current period is uh, is a you know doubling or uh, three times that general brain drain. The um, on the uh, chat, uh, someone has just prepared a document through Chat GTP about the brain drain in few seconds, and then he asked <laughs> me to download it. So this is a kind of power that you have in technology at the moment so so we can do this kind of thing so if we can at least write us one one publication so we keep it alive with new ideas to say this is the way to sort this out in the short term and in the long term in the long term means people should have the opportunity to come back even because abroad you have part-time jobs full-time jobs Say you can job share between two or three people and do the same job. I mean, that kind of opportunity is not there back here because that is why we are having such a problem. So so that if you give local opportunity, then people will be able to do it better. 
that's the situation. Is there anybody kind of willing to write something up? I can draft something from what we've discussed today. Is there data to write anything, Chula? Very difficult to collect the data. That's what is I mean. The, problem? the the people who have emigrated. The the question is, people do have emigrated don't have the best situations, because some of them who have gone recently are in more difficult situation, which is true because age gap is so different because they are moving up at say 40s and 50s and try to compete with the jobs who are available for 20s and 30s. So they don't get it. Even if they get it, it's too hard to do it. And yeah. so, 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 so the people who have immigrated, not that happy. So when that is the situation, they don't want to give a feedback. And my own people who I train and I reference as well, when they don't want to give a feedback to me, you can see the situation. That's a, that's a, that's a personally difficult situation for them. So, I mean, I know that because uh, I went back and came back and went back to Sri Lanka and then worked again and then came back finally uh, a few years ago because I knew it was becoming impossible to do anything back in Sri Lanka because of the protest and everything else. It becomes a threat to yourself as well sometimes. Yes, uh, Bala, you have raised the hand. Yeah, uh, I just want to share a few things because uh, apart from this, uh, you know, brain drain from the medical field, but it's also generally there's a huge brain drain in every field of professionalism in this country, I suppose. And uh, I think one, one, one reason I feel is this whole politicization of the state. And no institution is allowed to function independently that's we need to really see how to depoliticize this state that's another long-term agenda second thing is i don't know <clears throat> i don't know you may be able to uh, react positively because the now you say the professional associations how much the professional associations are active enough to ensure the independence or autonomy of the professional institutions and professionals and also, how much do they build their own recognition capacity to advocate for the requirement of the professional? I mean, there may be some uh, professionals they are leaving because it could have been real. Their problem could have been addressed here for them to stay back. So, what could be done in order to get these professional associations and the trade unions, <clears throat> for example, university trade union and so on, to intervene and try to have a sort of a very effective advocacy? That that could really you know uh, help to reduce this brain drain by addressing the real problem of people who are leaving, other than for economic reasons. Yeah, you're right, Pala. But the professional associations are also politicized. Say, for example, GMOA, for example, it was hugely politicized for about 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. And they, they didn't allow anything to surface. And and I remember the times when we were working at Peradeniya, how how negative they were to education and, and professional development. So, uh, so, I mean, and they interfered with everything else. And then recently I uh, invited the Food Up ex-president to come and talk. Mm, no answer. So... I knew him as well personally, but still, no answer. So, so you can see how, what kind of response. Some are still fearful to talk even in this kind of thing. They might have uh, repercussions back home. So people have immigrated. One of them was not willing to talk very much because of that. They were still fearful of repercussions. Ranjan, yes, Ranjan. I can't hear you. I think you're still muted, Tanya. Thank you, Chula. I, uh, we are talking about brain drain. Uh, the main reason, as I see it, the main reason for the brain drain is our economy is not expanding. Our economy is simply not expanding. And of late, what we see is it is not only not expanding, it is contracting. It's working in the other day. 
So as a result, there are no opportunities for the employee, for the employable people, employable young people who pass out from uh, these universities. And uh, you know, you know, it's bad enough as it is. We are not in a position the, the, to employ the graduates who are passing out. We are trying to create more universities. At least not we. Some of our leaders are talking about creating more universities. If you follow in the media, uh, do I have to mention names? So this is one. This is the. This is I think the main reason. One, two, the political, the, the highly unstable, uncertain political situation that prevails in the country. So anyone, you see, any right thinking person wonders what future there is in this country. So therefore they are going. Compare this with uh, uh, with uh, countries whose, whose economy is very strong, like Australia, like Germany, European countries, they don't seem to be having any problem, uh, problem about absorbing all these millions of people who come into uh, their countries. They seem to, you know, all those millions of people are able to find jobs in those countries, ready and waiting, in fact. No waiting list. They are going. You see, this is a case of utter governance failure. We are electing the wrong people to govern us. So what is required is to find the solution or a strategy of ways and means of putting people who are competent, competent enough to govern the country in this sense in which we are talking, not to extol Buddhism, not to um, glorify the Singhala language, uh, not to make Singhala, Sri Lanka exclusive for Singhala Buddhists. You see, those are antiquated uh, political doctrines. No country, no country, no economy uh, can be uh, can can be developed. You see, on the narrow confines of a language or religion today, you need the you have to you need to harness the talent of people of all faiths and people belonging to all religions and and languages. Speak other languages. We need everyone. See? So we have we have to get there, and we have to get there. We have to elect people who agree with this concept, you see, and not the people who want to go back to visit Dutugamun uh, and Elar. You see, so we have to change this mindset. We are concentrating, concentrating. You see, we are when we are talking about reconciliation and peace and racial and religious harmony, all emphasis is on the Tamils and the minorities. You see, no one is talking about you see correcting the mindset mindset of the majority community. We have to adjust. We have to change. The single Buddhist must realize. They, that they must live and let live. They must realize that you see the talent available to them within the single Buddhist community is not enough. You see, this is not only this applies not only to the single Buddhist community, or it, it applies to all communities. You see, look at the West. Look at the West. You see how that is why they see this, but some there. No leader, uh, majority community leader has had the courage to say, get on a platform and say this. Thank you. You are, you, you are absolutely right, Ranjan. So the equality comes just not from understanding, it's coming from rule as well. 
Now in the UK, equality is a very strong route and then a no discrimination is possible. And you can get you can get even removed from your job if you don't follow equality. So but the training goes on as well for equality at the same time. So the so this kind of methodology is not there in Sri Lanka. You don't train people to equality. And that's something that we need to do. And also changing the mindset in the politicians. We are all trying in different, different ways. And then uh, we have got a few things that's happening as well. Let's see how we can progress. But um, we need more people to think about it. That's why we are thinking about this edutainment event as well to promote more thinking for, for Sri Lankans. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. You, you, you are absolutely right. We need to change the mindset of people. Uh, Mervyn, yes, Mervyn. Thank you, Chula. Uh, hello, everybody. Sorry, I have been somewhat out of circulation for several weeks. It's only me come back. This was due to some family uh, circumstances. Uh, uh, nice to be back with you, sharing a few thoughts. And um, very interesting and a lot of valuable ideas. And I also scribbled down some thoughts in not partic any particular order, but I thought are relevant. Now, first of all, we started the topic with under the heading brain drain. And perhaps I like to expand it to call it either the talent, talent drain or human resource drain. Yes, the, the main thing is brain, the educated, qualified people living in large numbers. But also, since fam right, since maybe 1970s onwards, lots and lots of able-bodied people, men and women, to different parts of the world who have left the country. Some of them have returned in the old age or disabled and so on from Middle East, uh, being a burden on the country rather than a resource. So a part, you know, so the, the human resource, the talent drain means that we haven't even got enough people to maintain our roads and foothold and our public transport system. These are technicians, craftsmen, not always engineers and academics. So the broaden the scope of that. Then moving on, uh, the, the definition is people leaving our shores in search of in the past, we used to say green, greener pastures, or for countries and places offering better opportunities, better rewards, greater recognition for what they can contribute. Now, Sri Lanka has been suffering from this for many, many decades. Uh, India has, but whatever India has done for the last 10, 20 years, they have turned the tables now. A lot of very talented, very qualified, and people who have amassed great amounts of wealth coming back and investing in India, particularly in sectors like health, hospitals, and IT, and many other areas. Even for this moon project, I would think some of those scientists who are behind had first had experience in places like NASA. So they are bringing, repatriating, bringing the knowledge back to develop the country. Now, another thought is the historical causes where this started for countries like Sri Lanka and India, this goes back to the empire in English language. And obviously, uh, British set up the university system in Sri Lanka. And a lot of doctors or academics could do their undergraduate degrees in Sri Lanka. And the brighter ones, when they want to do postgraduate qualifications, PhDs, the obvious thing was to come to a place like England or you know, English speaking country. Yes, they had first class experience good recognition, rewards, and some of them returned, and some of them returned and worked for a while, and for the reasons that we'll discuss already, felt I better go back because uh, for my family's sake, for my own job satisfaction, for further career growth, I better go back. Uh, so that trend got in place. And eventually that grew to say, well, you know, for my own son and daughter's education, I realized the opportunity is abroad. And uh, it, along with that, also countries like Britain realized the talent, you know, having sucked out so much wealth through 200 years of colonization, you know, no, no need to go into that. We know how much, you know, they sucked out from countries like Sri Lanka, India, and other colonies to build the empire. 
And they also realize there is a leftover talent that keeps growing called the, the human resource, the, the brains. So created opportunities like you know, Commonwealth Scholarship Scheme, America has similar things to fish out the best talent into those countries. Obviously, our people go willingly. Nobody's forced to do that. And very often, the people who go are the brightest of the lot. The country is missing out on. And they go, they do very well out of it. We all know people by, you know, we have good good friends who have been through that. We we love them and we, we are pleased for them. But there is a cost that, go, that goes with it. The, the, the main price is paid by the country and people left in the country. And now this is, you know, getting worse. You know, IT talent and teachers are forced because of the reasons we are talking about. Uh, now, one thing, particularly leaders in Sri Lanka and alike, you know, this is not just limited to Sri Lanka. There's a similar massive problem of this nature going on, affecting countries like Afghanistan, Pakistan, and a lot of Middle Eastern countries like Syria that used to be very prosperous plus in the past and many, many African countries. And you hear every day the board people, illegal immigrants trying to either reach the coast of uh, Europe, place like Italy, and then France to England, and the number of boards that perish, you know, it's become a regular news item. Uh, overloaded boards, men, women, and children, desperate people, and also the, the human smugglers making a headache out of it, taking advantage, using humans, for their own gain. So there's a vicious circle going on there. And there is a couple of other factors people in power forget. Uh, one is Sri Lanka, while we are an island and our thinking is very insular, we cannot remain an island. We are in a very open, connected world. However much we deny, you know, China tries very hard by blocking Google, for example, trying to isolate information, keep their people to buy the local narrative, but we are in a very connected world. And often people, yeah, whoever gets to, to this side has ways of informing, communicating. There are endless channels starting from WhatsApp, FaceTime, you name it, to inform, tell the story, share ideas, intelligence, to find their way around. And human smugglers use that too. Now this is for the, the more challenged, the, the struggling mother, but people use that. But we are in an open competition and a number of speakers said the reasons why people want to leave, not that they don't love the country, me included, we love for Sri Lanka to thrive, uh, for the country to do well, it's the lack of meritocracy, the rampant corruption, the frustration it creates, lack of job, job satisfaction, bureaucracy, red tape, and at the end of the day, quality of life for yourself, your family and children. Those are considerations that are affecting people, that are persuading people to think, think and live. So if Sri Lanka recognizes that the competition is not just money alone, the other factors that affect human, human thinking, what persuade me to stay or leave, we really need to create the, those conditions that will persuade people, first of all, to remain, you know, stop from leaving, giving the, the peace, the peace of mind, justice, and quality of life, healthcare, education, opportunities for your children. So, so because we are an open marketplace, connected world, people share these opportunities, come over, my young, you know, you know, you can get a job, you know, part-time job, you know, this is how it's done. All that goes on. Uh, so if you ignore that, you can you know, make any, you know, any number of gasset notifications. Nobody takes it seriously. Life continues, you know, those things happen. Uh, then we sort of, one example, two, about a week ago, I was sort of listening to radio program where Romania, that was under Ceausescu until that regime was, you know, obviously at the end of the, the, the Cold War, uh, R Romania broke free from the Iron Curtain and uh, sort of jo joined EU. Yeah, and Romania had a notoriety because quite a high percentage of Romanians are what you call Romas, the gypsy that traveling people in Europe originate from Romania. And even in places like London, Romania or oh, Italy, Romanians generally are unfairly 
uh, seen as thieves and corrupt people. There's a lot of criminality that has come because they are heavily disadvantaged people. But that's not fair because there are very good, hardworking, uh, educated Romanians in and among them as a country. But the new leadership is enlightened and they realize quite a lot of talented medical doctors and scientists have left the country over the years since joining EU, looking for opportunities. This radio program described how, uh, over the last year, how they have doubled and tripled the salaries of doctors and consultants, and given them that sort of freedoms, you get job satisfaction, decision-making freedoms, and doctors from Romanian doctors from London, for a start, are flying uh, in a weekly to work in those places. First of all, they realize there is a need, they get paid, it's worthwhile, they can spend time with families, and some of them eventually realize this is here to stay, are resigning from jobs in the NHS UK, are going back. So effectively, it can be reversed if it is done properly with good leadership, uh, rather than window dressing and you know publishing another gazette notification. Uh, so I think uh, Ranjan or somebody mentioned something, the mindset, mindset of the population and particularly the leaders, uh, we need the 20 to, to operate and succeed in the 21st century. Uh, we need the uh, mindset of the 21st century. If you operate from the 14th century mindset, like the leaders in Afghanistan, or, or for that matter, uh, Iraq, Iran, or uh, I don't know what century our leadership and our clergy are operating from, we are hop hopping back into what they were glory days from Parakram Bahu and all that. We had to let go of that and we had to think and operate in the with the 20th century mindset, outlook, the skill set. That is how you can develop a country. And one example is if you look at the societies like uh, California, for example, uh, I had the opportunity last week to visit Sweden, Uppsala, for just a week. And I love the place, the freedom, the multiculturalism. It's a large country with a very small population of just 10 million people. So there is so much space around, there's no pressure. And also they have a show for the amount of wealth and the work there is, there aren't enough workers. And uh, the second largest ethnic group in Sweden are Syrians displaced from the war. So Middle East, Syria lost those people and they have got jobs working, building Sweden. And there is no racism, they're accepted. And Swedish isn't an easy language to learn either. And then there are every other ethnicity quite happy, like in Melbourne, like in Australia or California, where they are accepted. Religion doesn't come into it. It's your ability that matters. Yes. And people fit in, accepted, given opportunities for what they can do rather than your skin color language or religion. And until we get into that way of thinking, the brain rate or the human resource brain will not stop. It's an open world, connected world. People are communicate. They go where there is opportunity for themselves, their children and family. So that is the sort of political narrative thinking that needs to go into it. I really applaud Chula and the group for thinking that while we can't stop that happening, it's a bigger problem. In the meantime, we also can provide some solutions through things like a learning platform to provide that, put that knowledge back for people who may be outside the country or in the country, otherwise, you know, lack of teachers and doctors could uh, severely impair uh, uh, what we are trying to do in the country, short, uh, short to medium term. So thank you for listening. I mean, some some sort of random thoughts on uh, yeah, brain uh, brain and human. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, uh, all those ideas, uh, Mavi. And uh, you mentioned about NASA, and I think uh, Nirmalan mentioned about NASA as well. And if you look at the statistics, I looked at it. There are 2,400 scientists working in NASA, mm -hmm. and 2,263 of those scientists are Sri Lankans. Mm -hmm. So that's 10% of the NASA is actually Sri Lankan. So you can have a branch in Sri Lanka if you have the opportunity. So, so that's the kind of potential we have. Only thing is we need to create the environment, as you say, and we are driving hard, I don't know, to get equality into our constitution installed properly so that so that then that will go. 
And <laughs> I must say this minority um, slogan is used by some people. They don't want to talk about equality. They always want to talk about minority. Use uh, the situation for their own gain. So that is also happening. And and this is this is also the situation because there was a document which I received about Indian Tamils and there were two leaders. And then I wrote to them saying, why don't you come on and talk about equality so that everybody will be equal. They don't want to do that. So, so there is, uh, you know, conflicting interests among people. Although you think it's genuine, it's not quite. So it's very hard to do that uh, kind of work. But still, we can go forward in this way. So Lakshman has raised his hand. But in the meantime, what I want to say is that I think we can't just leave it this as a document we as a as a discussion we have to take it forward so if we can if you think your ideas you what you mentioned everything even if it's a one sentence can you send me an email saying any reason or a solution or something needs to be done in relation to brain drain so we can put everybody's idea together uh, in a document at least so publish it then keep it as a as a as a foundation to get this problem resolved so we can develop on it if we can actually deposit what we discussed today in some way so uh, lakshman yes lakshman yeah, thank you chula <clears throat> just few comments on what uh, mervin said yes we have this brain drain we have the general brain drain just like any other you know uh, developing country uh, which we have, I mean, we have been facing so over the years. But the recent brain drain, which is three or four times the general brain drain, is uh, going to affect the country. Uh, <clears throat> this is our concern. So two different things. Now, the general brain drain, if you think about it, um, uh, Mr. Kadir Rama said once, we bake the cake, they do the icing, right? <laughs> So when our people uh, go to a developed country, it's positive feedback. We have in electronics, physics, positive feedback. They go and help those societies to become better. And as a result, the society becomes better, uh, more developed, more and more people will be drawn in there. On the other hand, the developing country who loses the uh, brains will face the negative feedback. So it's going in circle. So that's uh, one of my comments. So uh, in response to uh, Mervin's comments, so the general brain drain is okay. We have been facing it for over the, so many decades, but the present one is driven by income tax, unbearable income tax on professionals. So professionals are leaving in large numbers and industries and uh, those services are collapsing. So this is a very special situation in Sri Lanka that uh, we have to focus our attention on. Then in the case of India, it's a kind of unique. Now they have come to the dynamic brain drain and brain gain. You know, people go and come with knowledge, help their societies, then go back. So it's a dynamic two-way process, which Korea was uh, uh, practicing in uh, late 70s and early 80s. Uh, people, Koreans came with knowledge and then contributed to the development of Korea. So India is having a dynamic brain drain, brain gain situation. And we mentioned about Uppsala, Sweden. Yes, ideal model country. I have spent my, two of my sabbatical years in Uppsala and Chalmers University. It is it's a very uh, typical society where this, uh, as he said, racism is not seen and even any minority foreigners go there and contribute to their uh, <clears throat> development efforts. And uh, in the case of NASA, yes, we have Sri Lankans in NASA. Uh, Sarat Gunapal and Sumit Bandar is from Peradeniya Physics Special Batch. There are quite a few uh, Peradeniya Physics graduates working in NASA, and they have developed this infrared camera, which was sent to Mars a few years back. Uh, but still, we have not reached this dynamic situation. And especially, uh, I am particularly concerned in the, what's happening in the, this the last year and this year, this two, three times higher brain uh, drain 
which will affect our country in the years to come. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, okay. So thanks, Lakshman. Uh, so I think what we should really do is to put something together from today's discussion so that we don't waste the time that we have actually dedicated to this. So if I may ask for you to send me whatever you think is is relation to ideas, any references to this, I'll try to put a document together and then circulate it to all who send the comments so that so that we can try and do something about this. So so the temporary platforms is something that we can do, which we are trying to do. And then we are trying also uh, to kind of bring a bit more auto uh, automaticity or to to Sri Lankan universities so they can decide how to recruit other staff and so on. So I think we should push for it. Even the schools that they should be able to invite uh, lecturers at virtual platforms and then teach students. <laughs> So yes, uh, Ranjan, you have raised your hand as well. Ranjan, you you want to talk, Ranjan? Yes. Uh, yeah, thank you, Tula. Uh, as I see it, uh, the root cause is has been and it is the failure or the in our inability the government having this I mean it says the internet connection is unstable hello can you hear me yeah yeah we can hear you yeah. we can hear yeah the root cause is our is a is that we have been we don't have a constitution that enables us to elect a government to that will uh, work towards this objective that we are discussing and we are we have a consensus on yeah so uh, uh, All, uh so what is therefore required what is required is hello can yeah you, yeah hello can Sometimes you hear me you break out that's right a uh, is to write is to is is uh, to create a right a constitution that will enable uh, the election of a government that would uh, work towards this objective. Now the weakness I see in all uh, in in particularly the seventy two and seventy eight constitutions here, the weakness that I see is. These constitutions are both partisan. You know, they don't have, they didn't have a national vision. They didn't, they were, you not know, take the 1972 constitution. The 1972 constitution was entirely, the objective was to, to uh, enthrone single Buddhism. No? They were, they completely ignored the minority communities. You know, they, in other words, to put it in a different way, they, uh, the objective of that constitution was to make singular Buddhism exclusive. So it was not an inclusive constitution. It was an exclusive constitution. Even the little safeguards that were there in the in Jennings's constitution of 1948 were removed. They were removed. Okay. So I something has gone wrong again. We can hear you. We can hear you. you. Okay. The seventy-eight constitution of Jia, whatever you may think about Jia, he tried to some extent at least water this down, you see, make it inclusive to some extent. Why do I say that? You know, he created an ex executive presidency which required this, all the people of this country, North, South, East, and West, irrespective of there is or religion, to elect the executive president. You see, giving an opportunity for the people of Sri Lanka to think holistically. 
that 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 uh, facility that ability to think holistically was not available in the 72 constitution it was not there right uh, to an extent to a lesser extent if you analyze even jennings's constitution he didn't give it the importance uh, that it should have been given with all due respect to Sir Ivor Jennings. Whereas in Jayant's uh, constitution, he tried to make the executive produce, he tried to enable the sovereign people to elect an executive president uh, with, uh, with the polity thinking holistically. See, above race and religion, the great weakness I saw in Jaya Javadana's uh, executive presidential system was that he opted to go, opted to choose the French system and not, he didn't want to go the whole hog and uh, select the uh, American system. Okay. This was the great weakness of the of that of the, of that constitution, had he gone the whole hog, you see, given full powers, I think you know there would be there would have uh, there would have been much uh, more uh, you know uh, convergence of the political mind of Sri Lanka, uh, and weaning it away from divisive thinking. This is my personal opinion, having lived through all these three constitutions. Thank you. Uh, Ranjan, it's not <laughs> personal. It's a very valid opinion. We, I must, I, I, I know what is happening. And there were two other people who really studied the systems and presented to us various documents in the, in the past. And actually, we have a proposed uh, election system hoping that it will bring the kind of government that we want. And I think within about two or three weeks, I will be able to present this proposed system of general election. So which will highlight and bring out people in a very fair way and represent people's interests. So I will present that. So that's a different story. So we are working on all fronts that you have suggested. We have not forgotten even the election system change is alive and it's happening. We are trying to get this through. We have a uh, petition in place, which is still gathering uh, signatures. We have uh, this uh, new election system that we are trying to propose and uh, which I will present in about two or three weeks time and then we can take it from there, Ranjan. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, so there are lots of suggestions in relation to, and also uh, we want a way as uh, posted by um, Marvin, a system to wet the candidates who are who are going for elections. Now, that is something very hard to do, but we can propose something simpler and then get to some kind of a standard. And uh, there are soaring systems that are used abroad in Singapore, I mean, which was shared just now, and so on. So these are valuable things. So coming back to our today's topic, can we please um, have all your ideas, if you can uh, just jot it a little bit and send it to me? I will try to put it together and then, you know, keep this alive, this debate alive, and then find some solutions as we go. I mean, we can't just do it in one go, but we've done well today. We've discussed uh, quite a lot of things and good ideas came through and personal experiences shared, So, which is very good. So I'll stop for the minute, if that's all right with you all, because there are no other person has raised hand, and then meet at 8 o'clock because we are going to discuss about the education event uh, uh, that we are going to do in December. Thank you all, if I may stop there, yeah? Thank you, Shula. Thank you very much, thank you. yeah, thank you. Thank you, Shula. Thank you. Thank you.